There was an attack on Johann Sebastian Bach, and in case you don't know, Bach is one of the most famous Christian composers perhaps we've ever had. Uh, lived in the 1700s, wrote many, many, many wonderful works. There was an attack on Bach, on his faith and his life, about 40 years ago. And this attack came from men who were some of the most reputed in musicology. Friedrich Bloom. And this man had the contention, and he said, Bach only wrote religious music because he was employed by the church. It was not a private matter that he wrote religious music. It was rather a public matter. He wrote because musicians at that time were really only employed by the church. And it wasn't a matter of his own faith or own sincere devotions but rather it was just for money, for livelihood. Well, there were many people at the time who were shocked at, at this contention and sought to defend Bach. But after all, it's hard to defend somebody's private life, something you don't see. Obviously, Bach wasn't around to defend himself. And what goes on when somebody is, is in their personally praying in their prayer closet, what they're doing in their own devotions or quiet times, is hidden. And it seemed like this would be an issue that would never be answered. That forever there would be this divide in scholarship that some would maintain he really truly wasn't a sincere Christian. He did it only for his livelihood. This was the case until about 1971. And there was a book found that turned this issue around. This wasn't a book simply of letters or manuscripts. This book was Bach's actual Bible. Now, this is not it here. They, my, my, my library card didn't work to check out his actual Bible, but this is, this is a, a, a copy of it. And I want to share a little bit of that with, with you here today. Christoph Trautmann wrote an article upon finding Bach's Bible. Uh, this was found in Concordia College in St. Louis, Missouri. And there's an interesting story. We know uh, when Bach died that there was an accounting of all of his possessions, his music, his manuscripts, and among that accounting is a mention of his Bible. Uh, but, but that book was lost for many, many years. It turns out it made its way to America, made its way to New York, was sold sometime around the turn of the century. A German-speaking immigrant bought this book, had it in his possession for many years, and then donated it to this uh, seminar, Concordia College. And it, it was just in their collection for many, many years. This uh, Christoph Straubman came upon this in, in 1971 and had a chance to examine this book and was astounded with what was contained in it and wrote an article about that. Uh, once again, you had in the community people saying, well, how can you be sure that Bach wrote these things in there? After all, it was in somebody else's possession. Maybe they did their own personal Bible study in it. And so there was another man, Howard Cox, who actually uh, put together this particular book here, who went so far as to have a handwriting analysis, ink analysis, and something called a photon milliprobe analysis. Of course. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Were they, yeah, of course, yes. <laughs> Were they actually, I have photons looking at the ink composition, and they, they looked at signatures that Bach had given on his own manuscripts of music and compared it with what was in the Bible, and there are some astounding things they found out. They found out that, yes, with a high degree of certainty, this indeed was Bach's Bible, Yes, those were his notes, and yes, we can draw some very, very interesting conclusions. Bach purchased this Bible sometime around 1733, towards the end of his life. And so what we see in this Bible are his own personal devotions and comments 
and, and markings in this Bible for about 10 years. And it's clear to me that he was somebody who really did study the Bible a lot because there are hundreds of pages that have his types of markings. Now, how many of you here underline in your Bible? Can you do that? Bach did too. How many of you use colored pens? <laughs> all right, all right, yes. Well, Bach used different colors as well. And also, mar you know, little notes in the margin. Just things like you would do. And I find that refreshing. That here, J.S. Bach is doing, you know, sort of what I do in my Bible. And maybe what you do in your Bible. The question comes up, and I also thought, well, which book of the Bible was his favorite? And that, I, I don't know for sure if I found his favorite, but I can tell you which book in the Bible, at least during those last 10 years, he wrote the most comments upon. Now, if, if I had asked that of you, I'm, I'm guessing most of you might think, well, let's see, what book, book does that might be? Probably the Psalms, right? Would you think that's the most logical one? Jude. But Jude? Yeah. Well, <laughs> good guess, Jude, I guess. Uh, that's your favorite book. Why not box? Yes. Obadiah. Yeah, Obadiah, yeah. I know we've got another... <laughs> Well, it, it's almost similar to that. Uh, his favorite book was Ecclesiastes. And I find that stunning, because if you know the book of Ecclesiastes, it's about Solomon looking back on his life, looking back on everything you could possibly do in life, and finding there basically is no fulfillment in life except in God. And it's a book about looking at you know, the summation of your life, looking at purpose, looking at, at what is my life amounted to? And I find that fascinating that that is the book that Bach looked at at the end of his life. I want you to picture this as I'm, I'm going to read this, this little uh, summation here. Uh, Bach had a study Bible. It was, uh, it was a translation made by Luther, who, uh, which was then uh, put together by Abraham, Colovio, and Colovio was, was the, the author who, who sort of had a study guide and preface. And I want you to picture this, and I, I've been thinking this myself, you know, what would it have been like if somehow I had been able to sneak into the room where Bach was having his devotion, and what would that have been like when he was reading this particular passage? And I just imagine that it's, it's late at night, I imagine, you know, he's had a long day at the church. Dealing with church musicians, I'll tell you, that will wear out anybody. But, but he's had a long day, you know, it, it, light has failed. He's got a candle besides him. He's got his, his Colovio Bible open. You can look at him, grayed hair, stooped over, reading this book. You can see the, the worry that has been etched into his face all these years. You can recall all of the children that have died of his, you know, and the grief and the misery and the financial hardship that, that he's been put through. And I know at the end of his life, many people did not appreciate his music. There were, there were critics of that saying, oh, your music is so urgent and it's so outdated and old-fashioned. And here he's writing week after week for the church and, and plodding on and thinking of the heaviness of the day. And then he comes to this, and he's reading in the preface, and he starts to read this in, in Ecclesiastes. The main point that Solomon speaks about and treats throughout his book is that there is no greater wisdom on earth under the sun than doings one duty with devotion and with fear of God. Further, that we should not be fearful if things do not go the way we would like, but that we be satisfied and have God's will done in all matters, large and small. In summa, in conclusion, that one be satisfied and content with whatever God provides, following the proverb, as God ordains, that will be my pleasure, and thus... Let us not trouble and consume ourselves about worry about what the future will bring, or rather remember that God has given me this office and work 
that I perform it willingly and with devotion, and that if my efforts and proposals do not turn out the way I hope, then may God's will and power prevail. You see Bach reading that and thinking, oh God, thank you. Thank you, Lord. You've given me this office, and I can minister to you, God. Thank you, Lord, for the troubles you've given me, and I can minister to them. Thank you, God, for the health that you've given me. Thank you for the wife you've given me, the children, those that have survived. Thank you, Lord, that you've given me a duty, and I will perform it. I will perform it dutifully. There's some lessons I learned from this as I've been sort of contemplating Bach and his Bible and and, and his, own, his own devotions here. First, we should serve God and do our duty. He's given to each one of us here a special duty to do. And we should do that. It says in, in, in Colossians that whatever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father in Him. We should do everything in word and deed to our Lord. And this is what Bach is doing. You can see this in the private devotion. This is what he highlighted. This is that insight and truth that one evening, one day, just sort of came to him and refreshed his soul. I wanted to refresh your soul as well. Another thing is, seek God in the private place, in the secret place. We're so fortunate that this, this Bible has been discovered. So now we know, without a doubt, that Bach was devoted. And Bach had so much to give because he was filled by the Word of God and he studied it and meditated upon it. He sought to love the Lord with all his heart, his soul, and his mind. He applied himself. The third thing I come out of this with is don't give up the fight. Here Bach is at the end of his days. You could say, I give up. I give up. I've worked so hard, Lord but I can't go any further. That's a bit like running the race and running it well and then 100 yards short of the finish line, just stopping and laying down. <laughs> no, Bach ran that race to the end. He was faithful to the end in all of that. And I'm encouraged as I get more and more gray hairs, as my posture stoops, as lines are etched into my face, I know that I can be faithful to the end in all of this. Let me close with this scripture from Hebrews. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, including J.S. Bach, right? So great a cloud. Let us lay aside every, heavy, every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, cross despising the shame, and is set at the right hand of the throne of God. Lord, as we get ready for our quiet times together, I want everyone here just to be encouraged, just in being faithful to you, God. Lord, just as you met Johann Sebastian Bach that day when he wrote in his Bible, the day when he underlined those words, I want you to meet today, Lord, with each person here in this festival. Meet with them as they look at their Bible. Have a special word for them, Lord. We know that your, your revelation, Lord, is fresh every morning. You have a new word for us to, each day. I ask, Lord, for that blessing. You will just minister to each one here. In the Lord Jesus' name, amen.